Hey, this is John Ray, Diginomica. I have a new podcast guest for you guys. Guess what? It's the first time ever on my podcast. It's Steve Brooks of the Enterprise Times. How are you doing? Hi, John. Doing well. A bit tired. Yeah, we are coming off a couple of vigorous days at Sage Intact Advantage, Las Vegas. Uh, a lot to discuss uh, pertaining to their market moves, and we're going to get to that. Um, but uh, first, I just wanted to, to kind of give listeners a sense of, of you and I, because it's interesting because in a certain sense, in a narrow sense, we're, I guess we're competitors. Uh, we both have UK-based publications. Yep. Uh, but um, the the fun thing for me is I get bracketed. I go to a lot of different kinds of shows. I get like lumped in in different shows with different people. And every now and then I get lumped in with EMEA journalists. And that's one of the main reasons I've gotten to know you, which is that's kind true. of funny because I could never pass for an EMEA journalist. You would not want to ask my opinions about the nuances of Brexit, but yet. I won't mention Trump. Yeah, <laughs> don't mention Trump and we're on good standing. Um, but one of the reasons why I wanted to have you on is, and we're, and we're talking about maybe doing a series where next time you grow me a little bit, but this time it's my turn. Um, it seems to me like you you put in a lot of prep for these shows. I ran into you once where you had prepared a number of hours for the interviews you were going to have. And you always seem to ask kind of like pesky, fussy questions, which I like. Um, so can you just tell listeners, like when you go to a show like this, like, how do you approach it and like is it like questions you're trying to get answered or do you have certain topics or how do you get the content that you need the classic answer is it depends to mm -hmm. be honest and that's always the answer you're going to give when i go to shows i always like to try and meet the vendor the ecosystem and customers and and that gives you a better insight into everything around that vendor it's the vendor conventions we go to that's where we meet you quite often john um in terms of the vendors, they've got some messaging they want to get across. But actually, Boy, the, me they ever. <laughs> the message they want to get across is actually it's it's important. They want us to report on it. But actually, it's what they don't say sometimes that's more important. And that's where the insights are often. Mm. Um, so it's trying to think through rapidly often what actually in what are they missing out, what they're saying. It's like when people talk about AI, what is their actual approach? What are they missing out in AI? And what are they not doing on AI? Right. Um, there's been a lot of vendors over the years, and I'm not talking intact to this point. We'll come on to that. Who talk about AI, but actually aren't actually delivering anything quite often. The ecosystem is interesting because there are a lot of people in the ecosystem who are often ISVs themselves. They're smaller. Um, how do they integrate into the vendor? And there's different ways in which they can do that. And actually, how embedded are they within the vendor? What do they know about the vendor that you wouldn't necessarily hear from the vendor and you wouldn't necessarily hear from customers? They obviously have different insights. And the customers, normally you're put in front of customers who, who like the product and who like the vendor, which is why you need to talk to other people at the event as well. Um, but even the people you talk to at the event, you normally ask them what, they, what the vendor can do better. And, and that's mm. quite interesting because it's often what they say and what they don't say again that kind of gives you the insights into the vendor. You can then go back and ask the vendor the awkward questions. Right, which is one reason why I like staying at a show for multiple days because a lot of times the first day you dig out those, those, those little follow-ups that you can bother with that are more informed follow-ups, right, because you got them right in the ground. So. Yeah, and, and sometimes it's worth turning up a day early, which I try to do as well because you can yeah. actually get the people – to talk about what they're bound to talk about before yeah. they've fully formulated their marketing message. Yeah, once those marketing messages get fully hammered out, it can be hard to peel them back. <laughs> and and the other thing for you, I guess, is is your readers, right? So do you have a certain responsibility to your readers to present a certain kind of view? Like, how do you look at it from that perspective? In terms of our readers, we we aim for the technical business leaders. That's so often C-suite, but really technical business leaders who understand technology. And, and nowadays, the CFOs need to understand what technology they need to be using within the wider organization, not just the financial systems. And that's quite interesting how the CFOs are evolving. And that's the case for the other, other roles as well, CIOs as well. Um, the responsibility is actually giving the information they need to make to decisions. Should they be considering this this vendor should they be considering this isv within that vendor's ecosystem and and sometimes the interesting stories are actually amongst the ecosystem often you you come to these events and you see you see an isv that might be a startup or might be well established but actually has an interesting story um i went to an event a while ago where there was a labeling vendor 
um, who produced labeling for food products. And actually the vendor didn't do it themselves. They needed the add-on. And for some industries, right. that's really important. Yeah, you make a really good point is uh, we overlook the health of the so-called ecosystem, the so-called partner community uh, at our peril as far as how well we cover a vendor. And, you know, one of the big themes of this show was obviously AI and specifically the impact of AI on finance and, and CFOs. And the reason I bring that up now is because that was one example I saw of, of you uh, pestering with questions because I heard a bunch of comms people like trying to get you answers. Um, there was something in the keynote that, uh, that, that stuck in your craw a little bit. Can you tell us about what you were doing there? Um, my background is as an IT engineer. I was a programmer. So you kind of get vast amounts of useless knowledge, but sometimes that can actually be applied. Some nuggets in there, huh? Some nuggets, yeah. <laughs> yeah I've learned a bit over the years. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a young spring chicken anymore. Um, when you're demonstrating something on stage, you tend to understand how it is created. And if you understand how it's created, actually, is that reality? They, they show a promise. When they're just showing slides, actually, are you being just demonstrated? Are you being shown shelfware mm. or is it actual reality? And it's and I, I worked for an organization once that, that had a very happy ERP system, lots of menus, but actually if you, the demonstrations only clicked on certain elements on those menus because the other elements didn't work. They didn't have anything. It was vaporware, basically. And, and sometimes people still provide vaporware, not actually as the end product, but during the demonstrations. And so in this case, you had an interesting question because you wanted to better understand AI, the role of AI in their demo because they were, they were essentially, they showed a series of AI things they're working on. And the one you were honing in on was an anomaly detection uh, uh, project for journal entries, essentially. And the, the use case is obviously valid because there could be a lot of error-prone journal entries. But you had a specific question about that. What they were doing was showing... They were highlighting the anomalies, which is relatively easy to do with AI if you've got a good set of data. So they showed we've got an anomaly in terms of our billing prediction that it's low. It's going to be low over the next few months. That was under very clearly understandable. I could understand where they got that information from. What they then showed was a a solution to how they can rectify that that problem. So you've got a shortfall in billing. How can we actually increase the billing in future future? What they showed was actually our customer churn is is too high. These are the accounts you need to target. What I was interested in was I understand how they could get to that, but actually there might be other scenarios that produce bigger or smaller revenue gains, which would counterbalance the, the loss that they had. Right. And it was actually, are they going to surface the other ones? What else are they looking at? Would mm. they show multiple solutions if there were multiple so it was it was a, a simple question but actually if you don't understand what they're doing they might just have been looking at customer churn as a solution and nothing else and did you eventually get the answers you were looking for they are looking at several other factors and would highlight the most important of those factors right. so not necessarily everything Again, it's just augmented intelligence in the sense that someone using a spreadsheet could ultimately find, but would just take a lot of work. And that's what AI does. It just automates and augments most of the time. Right. And, and there's, a, there's a, a realism that's setting in as far as this type of thing where it's like, yes, um, it could potentially flag anomalies, leaving it to the experienced finance person to hunt them down and see which ones are really worth investigating and dealing with. Alternately, what you're describing is more prescriptive, where it could outline certain options, which seems helpful. It's not prescriptive. Right. It's still augmented intelligence. Yeah. Prescriptive is actually be carrying out the actions. Oh, I think a prescriptive to... is suggesting a series of actions. But anyway, lingo aside. Okay. But, but to your point, it's, it's basically suggesting actions. Not, it's suggesting what? Yeah. Uh, it's suggesting possible, possible actions, possible actions right. to undertake or suggesting where those actions need to be taken, not necessarily right. what those actions are. They right. could be doing, they could then, I, I had a further conversation, which actually means they could then pass those actions back into, for example, Salesforce to say, these are the actions you need to take within your account execs. That would be prescriptive. They're not quite there yet, yeah. but they're quite close. Got it. Yes, and, and um, we could talk a little further about um, some of their timeframes on this stuff. But in the meantime... 
Um, let's just step back for a sec and just, can you just give me your general impressions of, of the show? Um, it's my second advantage as an ERP system it's very CFO centric, and, and you talk to most of the audience, they're all financial controllers, which are cleverly done in a sense, because you often to other ERP vendors, often you'll get a lot more business people coming. They have a very clear focus. People are there because they get CPA, CPE credits and they get to learn about the products. Most customers seem pretty happy with Intax across the board. Yes, most people here are going to be happy, but actually normally there's a few grumbles within some audiences which you hear yep. some of the things which people are short of doing. Intax seems to be going in the right direction at the moment. Yeah, and I think the the things that I was most interested in from my vantage point i think this is about my fifth in a row but obviously this was the first where i could really begin to get a better sense of the real impact of the sage acquisition and i tend to be fairly cynical i have to say about you know because we always hear oh it's a win-win and these are it's great and and i have a hard time finding too many acquisitions that i like in this industry so I'm always more cynical than I, I think the truth of the acquisition is it's almost proving to be a reverse acquisition in, in the sense there was an acquisition in the UK between Energis and Cayman and Wireless where Cayman and Wireless bought Energis and then the exec team in Energis actually went into senior positions at Cayman and Wireless. And that seems to be happening a bit within this acquisition is Sage have bought a lot smaller company, Sage Intact. Um, but actually they're putting the Sage Intact people in pretty senior leadership positions across much of the organization. And that kind of shows you actually they needed to buy Sage Intact to drive them into the future. Right. And what I found interesting was some of the details around this because so far I'm seeing a lot of benefit from Intact customers. I talked to a couple of the executives you, you're describing who have these multiple roles, and I was worried, frankly, that they would lose focus on, on Intact. So far I haven't seen that. Um, the th a couple of things that impressed me a lot about how they're doing this right now is that I think at least for Intact customers, Sage appears to be using Intact as some, somewhat of an AI laboratory where they're going to build out stuff in Intact first and then potentially use it elsewhere in the product line. That's fairly good for Intact if that's the case. Yes and no. You're pretty well spot on. My understanding subtly different, I think, is Sage has an AI lab that's outside Sage Intact. Yeah, yeah. It existed before Sage Intact. Right. And yes, you're right, but they're building the AI platform. They just didn't mention that word. And will have their first iteration is to integrate in Sage Intact. They will then integrate it into Sage People and potentially other applications. Now, right. their challenge will be integrating into things like X3, et cetera. Yeah, but, that's a whole other can of worms. And then the other piece that I did like is with the international expansion because what they what they have done so far is they've essentially intact is is leveraging web services that Sage has built to have localized tax and compliance stuff built in, which is an advantage for the company, right? Um, as opposed to just hand coding all that crap into your they've into your they've racks. leveraged things like banking and, and et cetera. Yeah. And they've also leveraged a lot of the local knowledge that Sage has in those regions they've gone to. One of the challenges they've got, and, and they will overcome that, is the multilingual challenge. They're not there yet on that. And, yeah. and once they fix that, you'll see it rolling out to the other 20-odd regions. Yeah. You know, it, it's interesting because what, what, what's, what Sage and Tech is doing is they're essentially, as I see it, is they have a very, very strong relationship with CFOs and finance, and that's at the core of what they're doing. And what they're doing is they're pitching the transformation of finance as – the way to make CFOs relevant in the modern context. And they want to do that by automating a lot of mundane chores and basically helping CFOs and their teams to become more quote unquote strategic. So the AI narrative and the AI products plug into that overall direction, right? That's what they're trying to do. Um, from what I can tell from their customers, they're pretty receptive. I mean, I think the, the challenge for customers is that they have a lot on their plates. I talked with one uh, last night at dinner who I had previously talked to. She she was really, Rob Robert Reed in the past had talked about this 80-20 thing of like, let's move from 80% administrative and accounting to 80% strategic. And she told me last year, she thought she could get there in a matter of a couple of years and she was really optimistic. So I was like, well, how's, how's that you know going? And she said, well, a little bit slower than I was hoping because 
basically business happens. Their, their, their company merged and acquired a bunch of companies. And now she's standardizing all of them on intact. So she's found a distraction, right? And I think that, to me, in a nutshell, captures sort of the challenge of all of this is that I think the vision is, is fairly compelling and interesting for people, but they are very busy. And, and in their real lives, it's not as easy. I heard another customer in line saying, yeah, I'd like to be more creative as a finance director, but my board is expecting reports and hard numbers and blah, blah, blah. And so just a little bit of like stepping back from that a little bit is interesting, like to see the contrast. I, I, I think there's a scale. I think it's interesting because I've spoken to CFOs who are being more strategic already and probably actually yeah. having, they, they've come from a point in a small organization where they had QuickBooks and were doing a huge amount of manual processes, implemented intact, that has freed up their time and some of their team's time and enable them to be more strategic. So, but I think it depends on the age of the organization. And if it's scaling up at the point, you do have the challenges of M&A, which then takes up the, the CFO's time. Um, so it does depend on the organization, whether they're able to start acting more strategically, having freed up their time from implementing Sage Intact. If they're already using Sage Intact, their probably time is taken up already with the normal stuff they have to do. Yeah. So, but they also have to educate the rest of the business about using dashboards and, and using some of the tools that they now have at their hands. Yeah, that I, I put that customer anecdote to Mark Lennon, who uh, that's another big change this year is that he was more the face of the organization now. Um, Robert Reed kind of stepping back from the face of, of, of Sage Intact. And I thought I'd trouble him with that anecdote and see what he had to say. He had an interesting answer because he said, well, yeah, like not every CFO like is in the perfect situation to transform everything. But he said, one thing you can start with is, is data. And, and okay, let's say you are expected to deliver these reports. Well, how about instead of delivering some canned report, you bring it up on the screen at the next board meeting and allow these folks to drill down in real time. And I thought it was a pretty interesting sort of, not really rebuttal, but a response to that because, okay, well, there's a good example of how someone could subtly push the issue in a way that would make that point, even if their organization's like not completely on board yet. So anyway, it's interesting. So what else did you take from the show? I, the other important thing was the, the kind of merging of Sage Intact and Sage People into the cloud native Sage business unit almost with, with, with the new appointments, but also just on stage, the integration they announced between the two platforms. That brings Intact closer to Salesforce. One of the other figures that they talked about was around 65% of the customer base uses Salesforce, which right. is a huge statistic. Um, so bringing Sage People close to Intact makes sense, and it'll be interesting to see how that develops over the next year and what other how tight that integration gets, and also the sales and marketing approach as well. Yeah, and, and I think the, the other big story for the conference is just that it's a very different product for everyone to wrap their heads around now, you and me, customers as well. Uh, a few years ago, you could say it's a cloud financials product. Now there's things like Sage People. There's a budgeting and planning push, which is a whole different conversation. They're now trying to not necessarily compete with the best of breeds there, but they are certainly trying to make that very much something that customers would think about. Um, and, and there's an analytics piece and some visual reporting stuff as well. Um, and then the, all the AI stuff. So it's, it's a company that's moving fairly fast right now. We're also seeing the start of the verticalization as well, I think. Yeah. So they've gone into healthcare. I think it's the first year they've really gone into healthcare. They're very strong in not-for-profits. They still need to do work in that area. Um, but there is some... There's definitely more vertical areas that they're going into with with better product, which almost it doesn't take them away from the CFO angle, but certainly I think they're they're appealing more to the wider business unit now. I did also want to make a point on the AI stuff that I did talk. We we you and I talk about like sort of like the the pesky questions. One of mine is always sort of when will this be available, and how much is it going to cost? And those are really simple questions, but they're not always self evident from the keynotes that we see. Um, with the AI stuff, they did box themselves into a bit of a corner with 2020 delivery dates on everything um, in some capacity. And included in the price. Most, not all. They, they're going to assess that based on the okay. nature of the product and whether it's considered an, an add-on or not. And, and I don't think they've necessarily made final decisions on that, so I don't want to speak for Sage and Tact here. But so, for example, 
Uh, they showed off predictive billing, uh, predictive billing capabilities. They showed off the anomaly detection, and then also uh, something I think called intelligent time cards or intelligent automated time oh, collections, yeah. basically. That is an example of something they probably will charge for, as it's a perceived add-on uh, benefit from kind of the HR side. Um, but anyhow, um, so those are things that customers are going to have to look at for next year as far as what's ready for me um, and what's it going to cost. But for the most part, you know, all I heard uh, from customers on that was, was give it to me, which kind of reinforces Sage and Tax philosophy, which is let's not... They, they said a few years ago they had like an AI visionary and it didn't go over well with the CFOs. And they were like, let's just bring them stuff that they can use. CFOs yeah. are kind of doubting Thomases. They don't believe it until they touch and feel yeah. it. And they also want it at a discounted price most of the time or free. Yeah. That's the message they want to hear every year. And they did hear more of that this year, certainly. The other thing, they do a great job of loading up with customers. Uh, I don't know if you had a bunch of customer things. I talked to a number of learn some good stories about projects um, and also some some challenges, right? There's always bumps in the road and I'm always reminded that you have to have the right partner. I talk with a customer who took over on a project that just, it wasn't the right partner and the right fit and they had to kind of redo a bunch of stuff and, and now it's working good, but you know, you learn that stuff. It, your partner is so important to any implementation. I, I didn't have that example this year, but I have in the past and picking the right partner is the number one thing people have got to do. And the partner ecosystem is interesting with Intent. Intent are doing some unique things with their partner ecosystem. Yeah, and the the only other thing I, I wanted to mention just as far as conference highlights is, and, and one thing I really liked about how they structure the first day is they had a short and sweet hour-long keynote, which is great. Ended 20 minutes early. And it ended early, which is like almost unheard of in our industry. It's like, wait, you're giving our time back? I don't even know what to do with that. <laughs> and but then they broke out in industry keynotes, and I went over to the software keynote because I'm particularly interested in what uh, the lead um, guy there, David Appel, is doing. Um, and one of the things he's done is he's interviewed a crap load of customers, and and they put out these slides that show before and after and the impact, the quantifiable impact of of these. And the reason the software industry is particularly interesting to me from a Sage and Tax standpoint competitively is because it's all about subscription business now. And that's not necessarily ultimately going to be limited to the software industry, right? I mean, there's so many examples of turning products into services. And, and that's one area where actually Sage and Tact is, is really mature. And I think they should make more noise about it than they do because the AI stuff, while it's cool, none of it's quite well, very little of it is ready for consumption now, whereas this stuff is actually mature. Um, and I think anyone who's dealing with all the headaches and opportunities around things like revenue recognition and automated billing and 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 just transitioning into those business models, I mean, Sage and Tech has a like depth of customer examples in that area that I think could apply well beyond the software industry focus. So you raised the question about benchmarking. They have some work to do there. Yeah, it's an interesting point. Most, a lot of companies, you think, well, can they do benchmarking? But there are different ways of doing benchmarking. Workday has vast data sets. Um, and, and talking to some of the, the other vendors who, if you're in a single tenant environment, it's hard to share data sets. So it's hard to actually get benchmarking across. You can do it. Um, intact, multi-tenant should, in theory, be able to anonymize the data, should, in theory, be able to benefit from that. But I haven't, haven't heard anything about benchmarking this this week at all. Um, maybe that's for the future. I think they've got enough stuff to work on. That's their problem. They don't know where to where to turn next. And actually, they're, what they're doing is focusing on what they need to focus on at the moment. And that's grow the company still. Um, but I think they'll get to benchmarking. All right. I think that's a pretty good wrap. I guess I could ask you how you feel about uh, you look forward to Las Vegas, I'm sure. Um, Fifth time this year. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you're gonna have to do like a UK traveler's guide to to Vegas, getting the most out oh, of it. That's no. <laughs> <laughs> you turn me down on that. I'll turn you down. On that's that. not appropriate for the enterprise times. <laughs> San Francisco, maybe, but not Vegas. San Fran. Okay. Yeah. Cool. All right. Any any parting shots? It's going to be interesting, as you say. One of the things that they've announced this year, they locked themselves in 2020. AI is going to be rolled out for point solutions. 
we're here in a year's time or on a land in a year's time. What will actually be delivered? Yeah. And okay, they'll have three months left of 2020 at that point, but it would be disappointing to not see something come out during the next 10 months. Yeah, they did, they did put a date on the wall that they now going to be expected to honor. And as Microsoft knows, that's a dangerous thing to do. Indeed. Steve, it's been a pleasure. Thanks for joining me. Off we go to regroup after a couple of vigorous days. Thank you. Thanks, Joe.